Hello and welcome to another flight theory video. In this video we're going to have a look at the effects temperature change has on the atmosphere. This content is aimed at covering objectives in the PPL meteorology theory exam. We'll begin by having a look at solar heating and how it varies across the Earth's surface. We'll then look at how heat can be transferred from one place to another and how the properties of different surfaces can influence this behaviour. We'll then look at terrestrial re-radiation and how it can result in temperature inversions. We'll then put this together and see how air masses move on a global scale. Finally, we'll have a brief overview of measuring temperature. The primary source of both heat and light on Earth is the Sun. The Sun emits electromagnetic radiation. The majority of this that reaches us is in the visible and infrared bands on the electromagnetic spectrum. The intensity of the solar heating at any point on Earth's surface is dependent on the angle at which it is exposed to the radiation. On the diagram you see on screen, you can see that the radiation marked as A is being spread across a large area near the pole. However, the same area of radiation is focused on a much smaller surface area on Earth in the example marked B near the equator, due to being far more perpendicular to the Sun. This greater concentration towards the equator results in a greater heating effect on the Earth's surface. As you probably know, the Earth rotates around an invisible axis that would extend between the two poles. This axis is tilted when compared with the Earth's orbit around the Sun. This results in the most concentrated radiation being delivered to different parts of the Earth's surface depending on where the Earth is in its orbit around the Sun. This affects both the average heating effect and the duration of day cycles. We categorise these variations with seasons. In the Northern Hemisphere, we typically consider summer, with the longest days and the greatest heating, to occur between June and September. In the Southern Hemisphere, we consider summer to occur between December and March. There are several methods of heat transfer. So far, we've been talking about radiation. All bodies transmit heat in the form of electromagnetic radiation. The hotter the body is, the shorter the wavelength of the radiation it emits. Absorption describes how any body in the path of this electromagnetic radiation can absorb some of this energy. The effectiveness of absorption depends on the properties of the mass absorbing it. Convection is where a body of air moves and carries heat energy with it. This can be seen with hot air rising and carrying heat energy higher into the atmosphere. While convection carries warm air higher into the atmosphere, advection is the process whereby cooler air moves in underneath the rising air as the pressure drops. Conduction is the passing of heat from one body to another. Some materials are good conductors. For example, if you have an iron rod and heat one end of it, you'll quickly feel the heat at the other end of it. Other bodies, such as air, are bad conductors. If a parcel of air at the Earth's surface is heated by the surface by conduction, it will not spread the heat very far. As mentioned before, the properties of a surface impact how they're affected by heating. A surface with high reflectivity will absorb less radiation than a surface with low reflectivity. Examples of surfaces with high reflectivity are water and snow. A surface with high emissivity will emit more radiation than a surface with low emissivity. For example, water typically has a higher emissivity than land surfaces. Due to certain properties at a molecular level, different materials can take different amounts of heat energy to raise their temperature. Specific heat capacity is defined as the amount of energy required to raise one kilogram of a material by one degree Celsius. Finally, most surfaces contain some amount of water. As heat is transferred to the water, it can evaporate. The result of evaporation is a cooling effect on the surrounding matter. Therefore, water evaporating on the Earth's surface results in a cooling effect on the surrounding area. If the Earth's surface is warmer than the adjacent air, the air is heated and transported away. As air moves over the surface, it is removing the heat from the surface by convection. As we've mentioned, all objects radiate heat, and the Earth's surface is no exception to this. 
This means that some of the heat absorbed from the sun's radiation is then re-radiated back into the atmosphere. As we've also mentioned, the wavelength of radiation decreases as the energy increases. This means that the re-radiated heat is a much higher wavelength than the radiation from the sun. This means that it is more readily absorbed by the atmosphere rather than being radiated out into space. One thing to bear in mind is that while an area of the Earth's surface is only heated by day, the re-radiation of this heat occurs 24-7. This means that the surface is at its coolest at around sunrise rather than midnight. This also applies to the temperature of the atmosphere near the Earth's surface. This terrestrial re-radiation can result in a phenomenon known as temperature inversion. While ordinarily air decreases in temperature as altitude is gained, on cold, clear nights the Earth's surface can lose a lot of heat through re-radiation. This can result in the surface cooling air directly in contact with it. As cold air is denser than warmer air, it tends to sink. This results in the cooler air no longer mixing with the warmer air above it. This creates a boundary layer between the two bodies of air, typically no taller than a few hundred feet. These temperature inversions can result in low clouds, fog and wind shear, a topic which we'll cover in greater detail in the future. As we explained towards the beginning of this video, the heating effect of the sun's radiation is greatest where the concentration is greatest. As a result, heating is greatest near to the equator. This heating results in the air rising and diverging towards the poles. Air from greater latitudes near the surface replaces this air near the equator through advection. The diverging air then cools and sinks closer to the poles. This creates a cycle of air. In reality, the atmosphere can be approximated into slightly smaller cells. In each hemisphere, there are three cells, the polar cell, the feral cell, and the Hadley cell. In the diagram included here, if we disregard the feral cell, you can largely see this process we just described in action. It is worth knowing that there is a minimum temperature that any matter can reach. This is the temperature at which it has no energy and is known as absolute zero. However, there is no theoretical maximum temperature matter can reach, though the behaviour of matter gets strange at extremely high temperatures, this is out of scope for meteorology. The standard unit of temperature in aviation is Celsius. Celsius was designed with the freezing point of water at zero on the scale and the boiling point of water at 100 on the scale. The US is special and still uses Fahrenheit, which has the freezing point of water at 32 and the boiling point at 212. In science, the standard unit for temperature is Kelvin, Kelvin scale matches Celsius um, other than that zero is absolute zero uh, rather than in Celsius where absolute zero is minus 273-ish. I'm not convinced that you'd ever really need to convert between Fahrenheit and Celsius without either an electronic computer or at the very least a flight computer, uh, but just in case I've included the equations for doing so on screen. As always, if you have any comments on this video or suggestions for future topics, please leave them in the comments below. In the next video, we'll have a look at the effects of air pressure. As always, thanks for watching.